Now, for this, I want to go through the nephron. I know that you've got the diagram of it and the information, but this will just go through what's happening as far as the water and uh, the reabsorption of it as well. Now, I've got the references right here, page 999 in the new, 985 in the old. Be sure that you go through that. That's going through ADH, it's going through the, um, the collecting duct with the aquaporins. You need to know what's happening there. So let's get started on this and see what we've got. First of all, we've got, here's the afferent arterial. We know that the, it's wider than the efferent. It's going to put pressure into the glomerulus. And in the glomerulus, then I'm just going to show you again, here's what we've got. There are the fenestrated capillaries in the glomerulus. What does that allow? Lots of filtrate to go through. And how much filtrate goes into the glomerular capsule? And so as we look at this, you probably remember or can look at your notes, 180 liters a day is going in. What does that come out to as far as glomerular filtration rate? 125 milliliters per minute, and that would be half a cup per minute for the two kidneys. How many nephrons? Well, there's a million per nephron or per kidney, and so we've got those. So we've got the filtrate coming into here, into that glomerular capsule. Now, along with that, you can re recall there were podocytes here. And I'm just going to draw a couple of them. And those were the podocytes that have the filtration slits that we said, well, they look similar to this. And in the book, you can see that. They allow the filtrate to come in. Once the filtrate is here, it's got to be reabsorbed. And of course, reabsorption is going to take it back into the bloodstream. And that's where the second function is going to be. On your notes that you've got, then you've got number one, filtration. And filtration, of course, is taking place there. But where is reabsorption? And so for this one, it's going into the bloodstream. We need it to go back. We can't lose 180 liters a day. There's no way. And so it's got to be reabsorbed back. What are the proximal convoluted tubules like? And in the diagram that you've got with the, the handout and the PowerPoints, you can see cuboidal cells with microvilli. Microvilli are going to allow the reabsorption. What is the way for reabsorption? You can see active transport, passive transport, and osmosis. Active transport takes ATP. It's got to have mitochondria. And that would be where you've got the, um, the glucose. 100% of it normally be, will be uh, actively transported. Uh, sodium, 70% will be actively re transported and reabsorbed back into the bloodstream. With that, amino acids are there as well. But then we get to passive transport. What did the passive transport? Those were the negative. So here you've got the negative ions are following the sodium. And so they are going to follow sodium. Now, when we look at this for following sodium, then we've now got sodium transported, chloride, phosphate, the bicarbonate are going across, but then what follows that? And I'm just going to write this up here. We've then got osmosis. How much water is going to be transported across on this side of the nephron? And so I want you to recall what percent that was of all of this filtrate, what percent? And hopefully you remember it was 80% that was going to come across by osmosis. But how is it coming across? That's where aquaporins come in. And so here we've got this term, and of course it means water, a channel or a pore, a hole, and it's a protein. But what direction do these aquaporins take water? So 80%, and here we've got I'll, I'll just draw in an aquaporin right here, and this is what we're going to see. Right here, we've got water that's going from the tubule, from the descending limb, into the capillary. And this will be 80%. So 80% of the water by osmosis on this side of the line. This side of that line is permeable to water. 
Now, this side of the line, I want you to look down at your chart and you'll see it's impermeable to water unless acted on by ADH, and I want you to put or aldosterone. And so ADH or aldosterone. Now when we think of ADH, what does ADH stand for? Antidiuretic hormone. And antidiuretic hormone means that it's going to reduce the amount of urine that's going out. So let's look at what happens here. As we're looking at this then, I want you to go back to here and to here and tell me what was the solute concentration at this level. And so what were the milliosmol solute concentration here? And as we look, you have got 300 milliosmol concentration in the glomerulus in this area, that's what it's going to be. But now there's been lots of water go out, it's become more concentrated. What's the amount of solute concentration at the base of the medulla? And so what's the concentration? 1200 milliosmol. So here we've got 1200 milliosmol. This is important. This was because the water is being uh, reabsorbed out with osmosis. This is now concentrated. But what else made it concentrated? We've also got lots of sodium and chloride and urea here. Over on the side, I want you to notice this sign about urea. And urea actually is going to spill out into this area, and this is what it's going to do. It will increase the solute concentration here, along with the sodium and chloride that are here. And when you look at your picture, you'll see it's pale pink here, it's getting darker and darker as you come down, and eventually it's to the 1200 milliosmol. This is because it's a juxtamedullary nephron. Cortical nephrons don't do that. And so we've got this 1200 milliosmol. But now what I want you to follow is what's happening as it comes up the ascending limb. And so the ascending limb is thin and it's thick. At the thin, we've got sodium coming out, we've got chloride coming out, and up here we've got it actively going out. Now, as we look at that, if the sodium and the chloride are coming out, this is going to be a lower milliosmol. In fact, it's 100. But then over on this side, we're going to have the collecting duct. This is going to determine whether you need to save water or let the water go out in the urine. And so over on this side, you've got ADH. Now, when we think of ADH, what is antidiuretic going to do? Retain water. If it was a diuretic hormone, it would let lots of water out. But this one retains water. How's it going to do that? By the use of aquaporins. So we're going to put aquaporins over here again and use them in this location. And here we've got aquaporins. On the textbook picture, I want you to notice the lady who's drinking lots of water running in the desert, there's lots of aquaporins open because she has got to conserve water. So if she's conserving water, I want you to go down to the base and see what the milliosmol concentration is for her urine. And if you look down there, what do you notice? It's 1200 milliosmol. So for her, running in the desert, it's a hot day, hasn't got lots of water, exercising, that's what it's gonna be. What would the specific gravity be of a 1200 milliosmol as compared to, if you look in your picture there, the lady who's drinking lots of water. So she's drinking lots of water, and what's the milliosmol rating for her? And so I'm just going to put this right here. For her, it's 100 milliosmol. Now, if you saw that in the lab, if somebody came in with their specimen of urine, it would look pretty much like water. Specific gravity for this one, pretty much 1.005, something like that, or even 1.002. This one, more like 1.025. And so, antidiuretic hormone 
opens aqua torrens, allows the water to go into the bloodstream and be saved. If they're drinking lots of water, they're going to put out 100 milliosmo. Now, that's what we're seeing here. But I want you to think again of alcohol. What does alcohol do? Is it a diuretic? Does it increase the urine output? And of course, when we look at it, this is what alcohol does. Alcohol blocks ADH. And it also blocks aquaporins. So now then, the aquaporins aren't open and it's not reabsorbing the water. What will happen? Increased urine output. And that's what we're going to see. That would be a diuretic. Alcohol is a diuretic for that reason. But I also want you to just think for a moment about caffeine as a diuretic. And caffeine was going to block the transport of sodium and chloride. And with that, it's going to make the urine output increase. Also, I want you to think of Lasix. And in your textbook and in the lecture manual, you'll see it's called a loop diuretic. It's going to act here and it will prevent the reabsorption of sodium and chloride and it will allow more urine to go out. That's what we're seeing right there. Now, another diuretic is glucose. And glucose is a diuretic because there's actually an overload of glucose. And if we go back to here for reabsorption, then on this point, we said 100% of glucose is normally reabsorbed. But if it's an uncontrolled diabetic or somebody with increased sugar in their, their body, then it's overloaded the transporters for glucose. And now glucose is going to come out in the urine but glucose automatically pulls water with it and it's going to increase the urine output. And that's where we call it polyuria. And so there's lots of urination. And that's what we see with that one for the glucose. So now we've got the, um, the diuretic effect that we have, but I also want you to look at aldosterone. Now, if someone is on steroids, are they going to retain water? And maybe you know somebody who's been on steroids for an autoimmune disorder. They retain water. How does that happen? I want you to look right here. It prevents the reabsorption of sodium and chloride and allows more of this, uh, with not allowing the sodium and chloride to be reabsorbed, then we're going to have the, the water retention. And that's what we're seeing with aldosterone. Now, we're going to see this again with the endocrine, and you'll, you'll see it with the electrolytes as well. And so this gets us through most of the, the um, nephron. We've done filtration, reabsorption. I do want you to look right up here. And this is where secretion is occurring. And this is the last chance for the body to get rid of some substances, like hydrogen ions for acid-base balance. And what would be the normal pH for uh, urine? And of course, 4.5 to 8 is the normal uh, for the urine, for the pH. If they're into acidosis, they're going to put more hydrogen ions out, they're going to come out in the urine, and the pH will be closer to like 5, and that's what we see. What else is secreted here? Drugs. If you happen to be an athlete and you needed to have your urine tested for drugs, this is why that would show drugs, is because they're secreted into the urine. Um, but the problem with drugs is that not just illicit drugs or illegal drugs, but medication drugs, they can actually kill to the tubule cells and it can block the tubule and then it's causing kidney damage. And that's what we've got uh, for the, the nephron as we look at it right now. The um, other thing, as you're looking for secretion, you'll notice that of the acid-base balance, what was the third line of defense for acid-base? It was the kidneys. This is the last place that it's going to try to regulate acid-base is here at the kidney level. If these aren't working, it, they could be, uh, it could be fatal in five to seven days if they're not working. And the, don't forget, glomerular filtration rate, 125 milliliters per minute, amount of filtrate made per day, 180 liters, but how much is going out as urine? And of course, on your 
uh, diagram that you see, 19% was normally reabsorbed here. That meant 99% was reabsorbed, and that was going to leave 1% as urine. What's 1% of 180 liters? It's 1,800 milliliters, and that would be in the range that we see where we look at 600 to 2,500 milliliters of urine being made in a, a day. And that's pretty much got us through the, the nephron. I'll do some other ones uh, just for you uh, later. Okay, thanks.